Hello and welcome to the show both feared and revered by Man and Beast, the headiest blog. Today, Russell Brand interviewed by Tucker Carlson. Apparently, the elites tried to destroy him. How could this go? The reason she's alone is because she's difficult. Women are not accepting the bare minimum. Women fuck men they respect. All the women who say things like, I'm strong, independent, I don't need no man, like, y'all impress me. Women just gaslight each other and say what they want to hear. The, some of the regional disputes, how they're escalating tensions. This is information that because of independent media is available and perhaps the function that we, our media organization have fulfilled is been to collate that information and convey it directly in an accessible manner to give people an alternative perspective than to the homogenized mainstream opinion, yes. which amounts to, I've learned over the last- The mainstream media doesn't care about you or the truth. They care about their own agenda. Last few years, the amplification and normalization of the agenda of the powerful, that no opinions can be allowed into that space. Yep. And I'm astonished by how jealously it is guarded. There are points in my life where my personal self-regard would have loved the idea that I would be considered important enough to attack on this scale, to spend this amount of revenue and resources on. But I'm now seeing that independent media itself is an extraordinary threat. The independent media inevitably leads to independent politics and independent thought. Indeed. Uh, here's a little bit more from Brand on the legacy media. Significant attempts to control the information space that are so rigorously adhered to and protected that even what you might imagine to be a marginal voice is considered a significant enough threat to warrant coordinated media attacks, expenditure on peculiar clandestine non-government organizations and think tanks that take their money from the military industrial complex from the legacy media, who, by the way, when they're critiquing independent media, they got skin in the game. They're not able to independently assess your work or my work or the medical opinions of Joe Rogan, they have a vested interest in destroying those organizations. Yep. It explicitly states on the Trusted News Initiative website, we are no longer in competition with one another. We have to curtail and stamp out. I think it even uses the word choke independent media. And it's clear that there are now sets of globalist organizations funded by government, but also corporations that are making deliberate, profound attempts to shut down any dissent in an astonishingly aggressive. Yup. So that's what? 1984, right? You can't think except how we tell you you can think. There is such a thing as wrong think. Way. And to be sort of caught up in it is uh, terrifying on one level, absolutely terrifying, particularly due to the nature of allegations that I faced, but also revealing, more importantly, it's revealing about the way, the, the way that I believe the world and in particular this space will be affected and the way these events will continue to unfold in the coming years. So Brand uh, makes a number of, I think, very accurate um, evaluations of the shape of the media landscape and the alternative media landscape. And it's a reminder of the importance of doing in the, in the alternative media landscape environment. Lordy Lord, I hate how this guy talks. Okay. Sorry. Uh, no, thanks. None of that. Um, but what he's done is offered me the what he's offered every other user of Twitter, which is a you know, a chance to broadcast your views without a gatekeeper there. Um, but I do think, you know, I think the technology at Twitter is my expectation uh, is evolving. And I think, you know, the subscription model, you know, might work or it might not, you know, mm -hmm. I, I don't know, but I think it might. And, um, and I plan to, I plan to stay there, but what social media offer in the short term, at least for me, uh, is an audience, but also a reason, this is personal, but a reason to write. I can't think clearly without writing. You know, I started in this business as a magazine writer and a book writer, newspaper writer, and I need to write things out. I'm very dyslexic and I can't, you know, I have trouble processing information in certain ways. And unless I'm forced to write a script, I can't really decide what I think about something. And so the daily or regular discipline of writing a script forces me and in some case, it really is forced. I don't want to do it. I'd much rather go fishing or bird hunting. You know, I would. But if I have to, I will. And there's something wonderful in that. You know, writing a script, as you know, forces you to think through 
everything about the issue you know, to have a much deeper understanding of it. at least th for me that's true so um i couldn't go to doesn't force you to think about everything long without writing or my iq would drop dramatically i don't think i'd ever recover we had Stephen Friend on here and the other FBI whistleblower. And, uh, like, uh, and importantly, and perhaps this is the most important thing about that story, one of their brothers and sisters has tattooed stick figures of me on their genitals. That's Perfect. the defining how issue. Is that, how has that affected his dating life? It's ruined it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, I think it, it would kind of kind of narrow the available population down a little bit. Significantly, <laughs> it, it's just me now. I'm the only person who sees that as an advantage. Oh, well, I am honoured. Do as you will. Um, but also, uh, on the, they said, of course, these FBI whistleblowers that the FBI had a significant number of agents, that there were other law enforcement agencies there on January the 6th. In fact, it was the whistleblowing on this subject of that course. caused them all this grief. That in a sense, uh, the, there are some discrepancies, shall we say, on how that event was initially reported on uh, 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 reg with regards to what actually went down. Now, what you've been accused of in the mainstream after you received, I think it was like 40,000 hours of footage from your man McCarthy there, was that you uh, sort of cherry-picked, is the phrase that often comes up, footage to deliberately show that it was, uh, to, to a degree, a peaceful event. What is your sincere opinion of what went on on January the 6th? And wh why do you feel that there is um, a, yet an attempt to r regard it as a deliberate uh, insurrection? And, uh, and also within that, I guess the, the possibility for presenting moments of peace within 40,000 right. hours of footage does exist. So were you sincere, sincere in your presentation or do you have a particular perspective on how I you was, wanted that event to be seen? I have, uh, well, let me just say, one of my children was there working in the building and called me during it um, and was right nearby when Ashley Babbitt was shot. Um, so I was interested in it from the moment it happened. I was appalled by the vandalism outside by fighting with police officers. I hate violence from abortion to the war in Ukraine. I mean, I am consistent on that. I'm not a Catholic, but I, I share those, I definitely share those views. I'm not for the death penalty, I'm not for killing people, I'm not for hurting people, I'm not for violence. And, I, and I, I've had those views for a long time. So, um, you know, any violence on January 6th, I oppose, I've said that many times. I would, was kind of happy to leave it where it was, which is this got completely out of hand. The only reason I ever got involved in commenting on it was, I mean, we did a show that night saying, well, this is awful, right? What happened was the lying about it was immediate. This was a racist white supremacist insurrection. Well, okay. There was no indication to this day that race had anything to do with it at all, like nothing. These are people who thought the election was stolen from them. There's some evidence they were right. We could debate that, but that's what they thought. That's a meaningful thing. If you've got a big population in your country that doesn't believe that your elections are on the level, you need to figure out a way to convince them that the elections are on the level or else you can't have democracy because yeah. it's a faith-based system. So that was the first thing I noticed. There was no effort at all to convince people, actually, electronic voting machines are secure. Which What faith? There is no, like... Tell me that elections aren't rigged or that things are, you know, on the level and that things don't go the way that the elites want or that the way that the elites pay them, <coughs> pay them to go. Tell me that that isn't how it actually goes. Because that's utterly ridiculous. Of course they go the way that the elites want. Well, you think they care about Joe Schmo on the street here and who he thinks should be in power? Of course not. Joe Schmo is not important to them. Which they are not. By the way, that's a lie. In any country that has electronic voting machines is by definition at risk of having its election stolen. By definition. No country that cared about democracy would have electronic voting machines, okay? First thing. But no one even, and by the way, many Democrats have made that point. Not now, but mm -hmm. 10 years ago. There was no effort to reassure anybody. They immediately used it as a cudgel Indeed. to make their political opponents shut up and in a lot of cases to send them to jail. So I noticed this. And I'm like, well, wait a second. Nobody here is operating in good faith at all. Sorry, that seems like a free democracy to me. I don't know what you're talking about. They're just immediately lying with maximum aggression. And anyone who asks questions about it, like me, and if you could go back and look at the tape, my first five shows on January 6th were like, well, yeah, it's bad, but... I don't think you're telling the truth about what actually happened. Shut up!
Stop! <laughs> Racist! <laughs> what? <laughs> so that's always the key for me. If it's like an infection, you know it's infected when it hurts. You press it. Ah! You recoil. They immediately recoiled when you asked any questions about January 6th. And that was a tip off to me. I mean, I had no thought in my head as I watched this happen on television and in the subsequent weeks that U.S. law enforcement or military agencies had anything to do with it. That never crossed my mind. I never thought there was it was a false flag or anything like that. I'm not a conspiracist by temperament. I never thought that. Um, and then I interviewed the chief of the Capitol Police, Stephen Sund. In an interview that was never aired on Fox, by the way, I was fired before it could air. Mm. Um, I, I'm going to interview him again. But Stephen Sun was the totally non-political, worked for Nancy Pelosi. I mean, this was not some right-wing activist. He was the chief of the Capitol Police on January 6th. And he said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That crowd was filled with federal agents. What? Yes. Well, he would know, of course, because he was in charge of security at the site. So the more time has passed, now it's been two and a half years it becomes really obvious that core claims they made about January 6th were lies. And my view about events and about people is if you catch someone telling a lie about one thing, the first question you have is what else are you lying about? If so what is January 6th? Cause I don't have any, uh, context. Let's see what it, what it says. Ah, uh, yes, abuse. Okay. Uh, January 6th, the United States Capitol building was attacked by a mob of supporters of then U.S. President Donald Trump. Two months after his defeat in the election, they sought to keep Trump in power by occupying the Capitol and preventing a joint session of Congress counting the Electoral College votes to formalize the victory of Joe Biden. The attack was ultimately unsuccessful, uh, according to the House Select Committee, the attack was the culmination of a seven-part plan by Donald Trump to overturn the election. Okay. Okay, so that's the context. If you say to your wife, where were you? I was at the grocery store. If you find out she was not at the grocery store, then it raises, all, okay, probably not just lying about being at the grocery store, were you? Like, what is this exactly? Why were you lying about that? And that's kind of the way I feel about January. Like, what is this? What well, this is, they're clearly lying. That's provable. Why? Um, and, you know, I'm the last person. I'm often accused of being a conspiracy nut. I'm the opposite. I grew up in a very stable country, the United States, in the 70s and 80s, where people didn't indulge in conspiracies because there weren't any obvious ones afoot, right? I mean, we took things at face value. We trusted our government, by and large. Um, but... Trusted. I, the amount of lying around January 6th, and it was obvious in the tapes that I showed, um, is really distressing. And anyone who's covering for those lies should be ashamed of himself. And that would include almost the entire American media, including Fox News. Um, people at Fox News, Fox News, to its great credit, let me air that. And I'm grateful that they did. But there, you know, there are people there who were mad at me for airing that. Really, why? If, if you think I'm cherry picking it and taking it out of context, show me show me where. Uh, and by the way, I didn't make the claim that it was entirely peaceful. It, it wasn't. Police officers were injured. More police officers were injured at the riots in front of the White House the year before, but whatever. All injuries to police officers or anyone else are bad. I'm not certainly not making excuses for it, but I'm asking obvious questions. You said this happened. For example, there was a guy called the QAnon shaman, Jacob Chansley. They put the guy in prison for years. There is surveillance tape that they hid until I aired it showing the Capitol Police trying lots of doors, trying to get into the Senate chamber, the sacrosanct chamber that he wasn't allowed to be in, and then escorting him in. And he kind of wanders around like he's taking a hit of mescaline, just kind of, you know what I mean? And like he says a prayer, he thanks God for the Capitol Police, and then he wanders out. Now, there are a lot of conclusions you could draw from that, but you cannot call that guy an insurrectionist. That's a lie. And by the way, an insurrection is a very specific meaning, and I'm pedantic about words because th they're the currency that I trade in. I mean, that's what I do. I use words for a living, so I care about their specific meanings. That was not an insurrection. It was not armed, and its purpose was not to overthrow the government. It was, it was a spasm of rage that Trump definitely it helped inspire. That's true. And um, at the election results. Okay. You know, I, I'm not actually for that. 
I don't think leaders should be making people more pissed in general. Um, but that's what it was. It was not an insurrection. And to put Jacob Chansley, an American citizen, a Navy veteran, in jail for years after he was let into the Senate chamber by uniformed Capitol Hill police officers, and then I play that, and I'm the bad guy? Fuck you. Like, wh what do you make of that? I'm sorry, it makes me mad just thinking about it. I said I wasn't going to be a hater. That it's, uh, sounds to me like, uh, what? Like suppression. That makes me mad. And I see people on other channels, it's outrageous. He's trying to minimize January 6th. Well, but what? This guy went to prison. Went to prison. You ever been to prison? You, Only for visits. Right, okay. It's not very nice. You don't want to go to, to prison clarify, to take a man's freedom away and call him all these names for something he didn't do and then show no remorse at all when you are exposed to have lied about it. There's a human being who was locked away in a prison. It's an outrage to me. Tucker. <laughs> like, <laughs> do you mind? Do you mind if I spoke? Sorry, 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 sorry. Worked very that hard was, to get in this position. <laughs> worked very hard to get in right? this position. See that Iraq Hilarious. war, like, you know, that was brilliant when you went on that podcast and went, like, that you're ashamed that you participated yes. and that you rallied for that war. Now to hear you talk about Jan 6, you're saying, like, uh, that sort of at the beginning you had no axe to grind and broadly speaking, you oppose violence of any kind. And I you do. Oppose violence. Yeah, I know, I believe you. And you oppose violence against the police, perhaps in particular now though it seems that you are um inquiring if not suggesting that there is another that there was another aim are you saying that it was allowed uh, the capital police to be funded differently and more ex extensively are you saying that it uh, facilitated further authoritarianism that it uh, enabled people to smear the maga movement uh, that it created more opportunity for surveillance laws and censorship one of the sort of um techniques that's the point of the elites, right? That's the globalist. That's their plan, right? So critiques that we use here on our channel when looking at news is, oh, does this allow people to censor more? Does this allow people to surveil more? Does this allow, for example, like a sort of just to use a sort of something anecdotal and contemporaneous, that there's a just stop oil movement in this country at the moment. And whenever you see footage of them sort of blocking roads and sort of road users dragging them out of the road because it's annoying like you like and i say this is a person who sort of loves nature loves the environment feels that profit shouldn't be put ahead of respect and love for the environment i can't help but feel that the media has an agenda in pre continually presenting us with these annoying images of just stop oil getting in the way of ordinary commuters who are just trying to get to work and i'm beginning to now critique media from that perspective oh they are using this event in order to elicit these emotions whether it's war yep. or the events of january Sixth, do, so do you believe that there is, a, as George Carlin would say, a convergence of interest between the state and its desire to regulate and corporations and their desire to profit, big tech and their desire to capture data, the state and their need to get data? What is it you're observing? Because when when I'm listening to you, you don't sound like a you know like a regular TV anchor anymore. And in fact, one of the things I'm offering is that that's not a role that's going to exist for much longer Indeed. because the, the centralisation of authority is becoming so rapid and so rapid radical that if you even work in this space you know with these new e law eu laws being passed that will mean that social media platforms will be heavily fined six percent of their annual revenue and that they can be censored the five eyes countries all passing censorship laws in a sense to become an independent media voice will be to become an activist so with regard to the january 6th do you do you think these events are used to create particular outcomes do you think it's just opportunistic and um, where do you feel the result the, your personal role is as an independent media broadcaster is now? M my, well, I think my role is to tell the truth to the extent I can see it, you know, to say what I think is true. Always with the knowledge that we see everything, you know, through a glass darkly. We don't see things clearly. We don't have perspective on ourselves, the world around us. We get a lot wrong. I've gotten a lot wrong, that's for sure. Um, but you do your best. And you cannot allow people to force you to lie, Period. So that's how I see my role. That's what communism did and still does. Uh, yeah, it causes, I mean, you know, Jordan Peterson, right? It causes very bad results. Um, I think you're asking the right question. And I asked the same thing about the climate movement. I mean, I, I'm bewildered. Gulag or Capelago. By it. 
Now, apart from my own family, there's nothing more important to me than nature. I think I spend an above average time in nature amount of time. I mean, I've organized my whole life to be in nature. Um, so I really, really care about it. And I'm very upset about the many ways in which it's despoiled, at least in my country. I mean, nature's not doing well. The environmental movement is gone where I live. And we pollute, we put up chain stores and strip malls and pave things we should not pave. We, we are very tough on nature in the United States. And the environmental movement does nothing to stop that. Indeed. And so my question for the climate people, and I have no doubt the climate is changing, it's always changed. I live in a place that was completely sculpted by the glaciers, which only melted 10,000 years ago. There were people, there were people living where I live in Northwestern Maine when the glaciers receded 10,000, yep. the Native Americans 10,000 years ago. So like, this is a feature of, of life on earth. Um, but, and so I have no doubt it's changing again. And, and I would be completely open to the possibility that people's behavior is accelerating that change or driving it to some extent. It doesn't sound crazy to me. I don't think it's proven, but I'm open to it. Of course I am. My question is really simple. Which of your solutions to climate change disempower you? Mm. So when you act your father on behalf of your children. Yes, exactly. Their, their so-called climate agenda is, hey, you, anyone below high class, you change your behavior and the rest of us, we're not going to do literally anything. You stop driving cars, you save the environment, we're, we're going to keep flying around in our private jets. You are doing things because you love them. They're not necessarily in your interest. Like, you'd rather go take a sauna or do some yoga or hop on your wife. But no, you have a child with needs, so you love that child, so you do something for that child. That's what it looks like to serve and love someone is to do something you don't want to do, doesn't help you in any way, but at least potentially helps that other person. Well, I... no, technically speaking, by kin selection theory, it does help you. If you help your genes, you do help yourself. See the climate movement not doing one thing that doesn't enrich or empower the climate movement and its corporate sponsors. Not one. Indeed. So, for example, not to be <laughs> boorish here in lecture, but I'll, I'll stop with this. Like, if I understand, you know, the, the ecology correctly, trees are like helpful if you're worried about rising co2 correct because they consume it and then emit what oxygen so if you're really worried about climate change caused by carbon dioxide you'd probably be planting a lot of trees i don't see a ton of and i would be very for that as someone who truly loves trees and spends a lot of time thinking about trees and I have a lot of trees and maintain a lot of trees i love trees almost more than anything so like where's the nationwide effort to reforest the united states I don't see it. Instead, I see a lot of solar panels from China that don't work, that actually wreck the environment, industrial wind farms that wreck where I live. Like I live near them. I know what they do. They kill all these birds of prey. It's like it's they're destroying the environment, but they're becoming richer. So on January 6th, tell me one solution that doesn't make you more powerful. Yeah, indeed. there's not one. So that's an indication of bad faith to me. And of course, yep. you know, I'm not going to be bullish and I'll stop. But anyone who's interested in the uses to which January 6th has been put by the people in charge in Washington can look it up. I mean, the surveillance that was justified, the total capture of our banks, for example, by the FBI in the wake of January 6th is completely shocking to any civil libertarian. You can't call my bank and find out what I spent money on. You don't have a warrant. What? That's not allowed under our Constitution. But they did it because it was an insurrection. Okay. So, you know, I don't know. I can't even guess as the mechanics of January 6th. Did the federal, the many federal agents in the crowd do this? Did they go along? With, I don't know the answer and I'm not going to speculate. But I know in the aftermath of January 6th, that event was used by predators in our political sphere to increase their power and to disempower the population they supposedly serve. And I'm very offended by that. Not because I'm some crazed populist. I'm not. I don't want to burn anything down. I'm like very temperamentally conservative. I like to build things, not break them. But you can't look at me with a straight face and tell me you're defending democracy when you get JP Morgan to go through my credit card statements. Indeed. You're lying. Yep. That's my only point. You're lying. Yes, it's a good point. So <laughs> <laughs> You're spinning me up, man. <laughs> I suppose that both the pandemic era and the current war 
uh, can have that critique equally well yes. applied. Who benefits from this ab ability yes. to surveil and impose, uh, for example, vaccine passports? Who benefits from our inability to openly communicate on these subjects? It always appears that there is a sort of an invisible hand guiding these events, guiding yep. the conversation, <laughs> amplifying certain voices, diminishing others. And it always appears to somehow benefit centralist authoritarian institutions be they governmental corporate or financial human and war does it especially and if i can and if you'll pardon me and i don't mean this as criticism of your country which i love but i've spent the last week in in england and i've driven all around it's nice isn't it what's well, it's beyond belief how pretty it is um but one thing that just i can't get over is the stark change the stark change in architecture between 1939, when you all entered the war, after the invasion of Poland, and 1945, when you, quote, won, okay? Architecture changed completely, and it went from designs that complemented the landscape around them and local material, you know, used in ways to, I think, elevate the human spirit, to a kind of architecture that clearly hates people. <laughs> that is designed to oppress the human spirit and make people feel without value, worthless, and that is ugly and disposable and made out of materials that are not worthy to be lived in, that are disgusting. I mean, so it is, right? So it goes. Because people were no longer important, right? The every man, the common man, who cares about him? All that matters is money. To quote a famous rapper, money is God. Rest in peace, Mac Miller. All right. Let's end the video there. Hit the like, hit the sub, hit all the notifications. Drop me a donation like Hunter M, Adrian Altum, and Bobby Dylan, Renaissance Prince, Brian, and Andrew. Shout outs to you, most recent purchaser of Strategist Guide to Seduction. Thank you. Buy my books at bit.ly slash books. My Patreon can be found at patreon.com slash the headiest blog. Want me to help you out? Well, I do offer coaching services. Message me at the headiest blog at gmail.com. That's my email. Thank you so much for listening, guys, especially if you listen to the end. I really do appreciate it. Take care of yourselves, and I'll see you next time.